oh, come on, can we worship him just for a little bit? Can we get him in a place and uh, just a little bit of place in our heart tonight? Can we just go to a place? I'm always asking and just 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 a little bit longer, a little bit further. He's brought you to this place. I'm always asking that we just rend our hearts onto him tonight. We've made it to Wednesday, saints. We've made it. We've made it. And it's not by our own might or our own will, but glory to God. It's it's by, with, and through our heavenly and precious Father that we've made it here today. It's the 2nd of March. It's Wednesday at 7 o'clock, so therefore it's Bible study time. Here at Living Spirit Ministries, we're doing exactly what the word it tells us to do, to study and show thyself approved. A workman need not be ashamed, but rightly divide the word. So go with me as we just calm our hearts just a little bit. Some of us are pressing to get to the place. I'm pressing to get to the place. But let us settle on him. If we settle on him, I guarantee you that everything else will fall into place. Let us go. Let us go to that place where we can rest in him. Let us go to that place where we can learn from him. Let us go to that place in which we could just grow in him. Can we go there tonight? All right. All right. So we're going to continue tonight. We're going to continue on. This is this is probably going to be posted as part four, uh, but it's a continuation of part four. We're as it, those that are repeat offenders know that we're studying about sound investment strategies, right? Uh, and we're not just talking about fiscally, we're talking about spiritually and what God has got for you in this season. That's what we're talking about the span of the year. But a subsection of that, we talked about return on investment. And that return on investment, we talked about uh, twofold investment, God's investment into you and what you in turn do with that investment. And so we talked a little bit about return on investment. So we'll go over that real quickly. But at this point, this is really the second part of part four, uh, talking about the implications of sin, right? What, what, what we're giving back into this world, our new nature, our new walk, and right, a new destiny, which is death. And so we'll continue to go over that and we'll get to part two of that. But the severity of sin, and so you can't really understand truly what he has invested into you, what he is investing into you, and what is yet to come, unless you understand the outputs of what we have. And so there's going to be some some key scriptures here we're going to go over. There's going to be some key scriptures that are going to be some repeat offenders here as well, but we need you to keep that in the forefront of your mind to walk and talk that and to understand these things that there, there is a consequence to sowing to self. There's a consequence to sowing to the flesh and of that flesh you will reap as Paul tells us in Galatians 6. But if we separate ourselves from the thing called the world uh, and, and, and get ourselves back to our heavenly father, there is a light and there's a gracious light at the end of the tunnel, not that one that we have earned, not that we could afford, and certainly not what we deserve. So that's what we're learning here. We're learning about how to shrewdly invest and invest not what is our own, but what is freely given to us and what is meant to freely be given to others. Let us go into prayer. Gracious and benevolent Father, we call to you and we just glorify your holy name. We thank you for this day, this hour, this very moment. We thank you for your tender mercies, Father God. We thank you for your compassion. We thank you for your love. And Father God, most importantly, we thank you for you. And Father God, we don't deserve you. And, and Father God, we know that nothing we could do can ever, ever give back what you have already given to us, Father God. So if we don't get another thing, we just say thank you for what you have already given. And that is you, Father God. And so we ask for all of you tonight as we go into this word. Open up our hearts, minds, bodies, and souls so that we might learn a little bit about you, Father God. That we might come to know you, we might come to trust you, Father God, and then subsequently come to believe in you. Now, Father God, we're asking that this word penetrates the hearts, minds, bodies, and souls of all the believers, Father God. But that they might be equipped, empowered, and encouraged to be the light bearers, to go out, Father God, and just touch the lives of the one, Father God. You said heaven would rejoice that just one sinner would repent, Father God. Let us be of like mindset, Father, as we go forward. And Father, if you can heal us eternally, Father God, and bridge that gap between our eternal separation and Father God, these slight afflictions, no matter how severe they might be to us in the natural, Father God, they're nothing to you. So we confess them and we give them to you, Father God. And we thank you now in advance for your healing, Father God. We thank you now for your restoration and your deliverance. Now, Father God, strengthen the weak knees, Father God. And straighten up the crooked back, Father God. Let us be equipped, empowered, and encouraged in Jesus' holy and mighty name. Amen. Anyone happy to be in a place tonight? Anyone just happy that he is, he is here with us tonight? 
Oh, we're, we're in a place, we're in a place, we're in a place. Uh, I'm just glorying in his name right now. Uh, we're going to put these slides, hopefully you're seeing the slides up on, uh, up on Facebook. All right, so you see the banner slide there. Uh, I think we, 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 we worked out some of the, the wickets. Uh, we seem to get this pretty decently well for Bible study, but for some reason for Sunday service, I, I, I seem to get a little ahead of myself. Okay, so, so the banner there. All right, and I, I continue to keep this up here because again, the overarching theme for us this year is sound investment strategy, right? And so we talked about that twofold investment what God has already planned into us and what we give out into the world. Now, you'll, you'll hear us use terms such as the regenerated Christian, the regenerate man, the, the saved person, uh, uh, the born again, all the same, right? And so that's that seed of Christ in you. You believed in Jesus Christ for eternal salvation. So we'll use those interchangeably. We'll talk a little bit about sanctification. In other words, that being set apart. And you'll, talk, you'll hear me talk about that spiritual maturity um, that, that, that progressive walk, uh, sanctification, spiritual maturity, um, and, 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 and you'll hear that interchange with discipleship there. Those are choices, right? Um, a little bit separate of your position, right? If you, if you believe in Jesus Christ for eternal salvation, that position is secure. That's what we believe here. That position is secure, but your familiarity, your, your practice in him, if you will, is at risk. And so um, in, in a different date different times the lord says the same we'll, we'll break it down in in terms of romans 6 and, and why that's of significance and we'll talk some other things about why we still have a lot to gain the regenerated christian the, the born again the, the, the saved christian um because paul addresses it he says that the grace abounds all the more in sin and so of course the natural progression is is then and we should just go on sinning right that, that god's grace might abound even more and he and he tells us, no, that's not the case because we no longer have anything in common with that. And so those are some of the things we're, we're going to road towards. So, so a little bit of spoiler there, a little something to, to, to throw the, the hook into the line and, and get you caught on it to, to pull you back in for, for subsequent Bible studies. But it's not, it's not cheating to read ahead. So, so check, check it out um, ahead of time and come fill it with questions. Those who are on Facebook Live also know that you can pipe in um, to, to, to Zoom. So we're streaming this over Zoom. The ultimate goal is to have an interactive session. Uh, I'm not sure really if, if there's a whole lot of folks other than me up on Zoom, but I'm just glad to have you here because you could be any place in the world. And, and the power of, of Zoom, as we're talking about God's investment, he's given us this tool that if you have questions, you can either text it through to Facebook Live, but you can also come up on the net here and you can also interact and ask some of those questions there. And so um, good collaborative session. If not, we'll continue on um, as, as God continues to pour out his word into our lives. All right. So so one of the things we've talked about now going on the third week, which really third trending fourth week is this return on investment. And I've, I've, I've narrowed this down a little bit over the last two weeks. We had a couple of more slides there, um, a, a couple of more pictures, if you will. But I really want to focus uh, here, just like we did last week on this return on investment formula. And one of the things that, that we talk about is, is the net gain, the net, the net investment gain, right? It's what you put in. Um, and, and, uh, it's, or excuse me, it's what you get out, right? Um, as, as opposed to what you put in. And so for the regenerate a Christian, <laughs> our profit margin is just exponential because there's nothing that we can do to put in, uh, to gain our salvation because we are not a deeds-based religion we don't believe our deeds and and we've talked about this because it's uh romans 6 tells us that the wages of sin is uh the wages of sin is death right romans 3 tells us that uh, there's none righteous among us not one and that's 3 and 10 and then in romans 3 and 23 it tells us that uh all have sinned and fall short of the glory of god so in other words our outputs right based upon this investment that god has put into us our output uh, is still a sinful nature and why we necessitate um, and, and, and have to have a savior um, because our actions just aren't going to bridge that gap here. And so when you look at the lower left-hand corner here, it talks about Galatians and, and the apostle Paul hits it very eloquently. He talks about how God will not be deceived. He won't be mocked. Okay. Um, as you sow, so shall you reap. 
And so, in other words, sowing is simply investing. And so, as he has invested into us freely by sending his son to the cross to take the sins he didn't commit and to take a death he didn't deserve, um, his grace is exhibited on the cross. It does all the work. The grace does all the work, right? It does all the work for us. We simply have to believe. Now, understand this. Our faith isn't what causes us to be atoned and to heal. It's the faith in the object, the object that is Jesus Christ, Christ crucified on the cross. That's the grace. That's the grace that we're believing in and that he's already given it. We simply have to believe. We're justified, another fancy word, made approved, right? Justified meaning made approved by our faith. Not our faith in our own works, because those works will take you someplace, but it is in the opposite direction of God. And I need you to understand this when we're talking about sound investment strategy, the overarching theme, right? You have to understand this because there's nothing that we can do. And that's what cover to cover of the Bible, the 66 books, the canonized books says, right? We were created out of love. We fell out of lust and God has been drawing us back ever since. Now, the, the glory behind all that is, is he's never going to force us. You have a decision to make. Um, we have decisions to make. And, and really, when you come to Christ, it's the most difficult decision that you ever make because it's not just about being aware, right? I, I, I'm, I'm a Christian and you just wear the title, but you're a bearer. And it's a new walk because certainly if you don't identify it, the world will identify you with that. And just understand this, that as one door closes, another one opens. And there's a lot of things that entail in that. And so that's what we want to help you with. We want to help you uh, mature on that walk, if you are willing, as we equip you with God's word and as you go forth, right? So as we go forth here, one of the key things that, that, that Paul talks about is that sowing and that reaping. He's talking about uh, what you should really invest in. And we, we compare and contrast that with Jesus's Sermon on the Mount, right? Um, we talked about Matthew 5, chapter 5 through 7. And in chapter 5, you see the Beatitudes there. Um, and chapter 6 is really where we put center sector and where we focused and where he talks about not serving mammon. And, and, and Pastor Talisa talked about it in her sermon a little bit this past Sunday. And, and, and what I like to call fool's gold. And, and it's, it's just essentially money and, and going after things, the love of that before God. And he, and he talks about how self-righteousness, the piety and, and, and having some sort of form of godliness, self-righteousness just isn't going to do. So you can sow to all these deeds that look right, sound right. They maybe even feel right, but that's not what's going to save you. Only that faith in the right object is going to save you. And so he presents that to his people. He presents it to Israel, right, to the Jews and, and, and Judah at the time. He presents it there. The people that were expecting a Messiah, another fancy word for anointed one, right? They're expecting him, but they were expecting more of a political figure um, than a spiritual eternal salvation that he was ready to usher in by, with, and through the kingdom there. Um, and so they couldn't comprehend that. And still today, there are many people on this earth, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of religion, that still can't comprehend that. So Paul comes back uh, to the church of Galatia, and he's, he's coming on the heels. And this is the whole point of the book of Galatians, where he had Judaizers that are, are converted Jews uh, to the Christian faith, but they're still trying to add parts of the Mosaic law back onto that. So it was Christ. Uh, dot, 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 or faith plus some sort of works and some sort of actions. And so he goes back and he rebukes that. He gives them the qualifications which were being attacked. He talks about how the law cannot save. The law was only meant to show the severity of sin. It was to make us aware of that. But where Christ comes, that's the, that's the, the, the fulfillment of the law there. He says, I am the fulfillment of the law. He said, I didn't come to necessarily in it, but I'm the fulfillment of it. Because when he gives the new covenant, that means that the way that God dealt with sin was changed. And that's where grace really began to abound and to enter into the world there. So hopefully you're learning something there. And if you know this, hopefully it's reinforcing and encouraging your faith walk there. But really, truly, the, 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 the end portion of Galatians um, comes to this and where, where Paul is talking about reaping and sowing. And just like a, a natural harvest where you sow and you sow on fertile ground and of that you shall reap. But if you put very bad seed into very bad ground, 
right? Or even good scene in the background, you're, you're gonna, your yield is not gonna be quite what it should be. And so both Jesus and, the, and his, Jesus' spirit through Paul, uh, the anointing that was placed on Paul are imploring God's people to seek him out first and to use what the unction of the spirit and his word is coaching, teaching, and mentoring on how to live and how to invest those things in which God has already given us. And first and foremost, he's given us the salvation and eternal deliverance from death, from an eternal separation, eternal death, right? And when we are his, we have the Holy Spirit that serves as an earnest, a guarantee of all these promises that, that, that God has given to us through Jesus Christ. But to boot, he gives us gift, right? So um, we'll, we'll get into that word. We talked a little bit last week about the word uh, charis, uh, coming from charisma, meaning gifts, um, and to give freely. Um, and we talk about grace and so forth. So we'll break those down a little bit more there. But if you look at the lower right hand, and we're, we're going to just give this real quickly and then go on to the next one. When you talk about investment, right, in a natural world, no broker is going to tell you that you just want to um, put in a whole bunch of money and just get a little bit of trickle back. No. Well, let me rephrase that. They might, but they're not worth much of anything, and you should probably get rid of them if that's what they're telling you. A good broker is going to tell you how to maximize your gains with the minimal amount of inputs, right? And as Christians, we, we, we live off of that because our input is zero. Uh, but everything about God and his love and his grace and his mercy allows us to succeed exceedingly and abundantly and above all that we could ask for, hope for, think of, right? And so when you look at this lower right hand um, uh, pictorial here, and I think this is very poignant here, uh, coming from Mark 8 and 36, it, it tells us what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his soul, right? That's the account. And this is what Jesus is coaching us today. This is what he's, he's trying to, to coach us to make the informed decision. So when we go to invest in things, um, are we investing in eternal life that is not by our actions or are we uh, investing in eternal damnation? It's either or, it's very simple um, because he tells us there's a way that seems right uh, to man, but in the end it leads to what? To death, to destruction. And so what good is it for us to have all the stuff of the creator without the creator? Um, and then when the finality comes, we need the creator to get into the place and where she is. And then we can have all the stuff of the creator, right? We could have the created with the creator, but we have to seek the creator first. So, so how I normally say this is you can have all the things of God and not have God and have nothing. Okay, but you can have nothing but God and have it all. So, so consider that. And I think that's encapsulated here in the lower right-hand corner here. It says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his soul? And so think about what you're investing into. And, and Matthew 6 really hits that home. And that's what Jesus is talking about. Your self-righteousness isn't going to get you there. Your accumulation of stuff isn't going to get you there. Now, if, you're, if your love is for God and not just for what he can give you, but for God then he will abundantly give you all the things that not necessarily, not just necessarily what you need, right? Because he's always going to take care of what you need. Hence, uh, seek first the kingdom of God, and then all these things will be added to you. And it's talking about how uh, not worrying about needing to be clothed or what you're going to eat and so forth. And he talks about how they all, all the other creatures uh, he takes care of and how much more we are, how much more meaningful. Hence, we are God's investment. And so we compare and contrast that back to Genesis chapter one and Genesis chapter two, how he gave us dominion. He gave us increase and he gave us um, he, he gave us the ability to to walk in his image. But we corrupted that image. And I use the analogy of, of your computer and how if you plug into the wrong things or you tap into the wrong things, that image is corrupted. And, and a lot of times that image has to be wiped out. Well, this is what it does, right? The flesh and the spirit can't occupy the same place, but you have to make an informed decision, just like you make an informed decision of whether or not to put that anti-virus software in your computer and keep it updated, and then not to go into suspect websites and not to go in uh, and update uh, and, and open suspect emails and so forth. Um, these are the same things. So you invest to keep that system running 
on all cylinders and operating according to how it was originally imaged. And that's what, what the Apostle Paul is telling us here. That's what Jesus is telling us here. It doesn't profit you. Maybe short-term games, right? But we're in this for the long-term games because this thing called your body, it has an expiration date, right? And it from the time that it's conceived to the time it comes out the womb, um, there is an expiration date. That's why time is so so much importance to men and to women. It doesn't mean much anything to God because he, he is time. He spans time, right? But everyone is appointed once to die and to be judged. And those who trust and believe in Jesus Christ for eternal salvation will go before the Bema seat. And what we'll be judged by is works, but works doesn't get us into, in, into the kingdom, right? So that's our, our position, as I said, is secure. But those works, and in terms of advancing the gospel and taking care of God's people and so forth, those are things that you hear about in terms of crown of life and so some of these other things you'll hear from the author of Hebrews and, and Paul and Peter talks about a little bit and, and, and so forth. Um, so we have much to still gain for working and laboring for God after we receive past salvation, our justification, right? Our current salvation, that sanctification, aka spiritual maturity, aka discipleship um, that allows us to advance in this thing called Christ. And then our future, our future salvation, which is glorification when Christ comes back and receive those glorified bodies. Right. And so we have, we have a lot yet to, to continue to look forward to um, as, as our Lord and our savior has not forgotten about us. Hopefully everyone's catching that. If not, um, we'll, we'll continue to, to, to build on that foundation there. All right, so the next slide you should be seeing here is uh, it, it's got a couple of things that I just absolutely love. In the upper upper left-hand corner there, um, we talk about the really the beginnings of, of, of the fall there. So we know all, all slick Satan taking the form of a serpent came. Um, we start to see him coming in at the beginning of Genesis 3. And Genesis 3 really is all about the fall. We stumbled, we bumbled, we fell, and then truly we never really got back up because we wouldn't take ownership into this thing. And so as we went forth, um, as you look down here, the Lord asked a very pointed question because he asked the man, you know, where are you? He asked Adam, hey, where are you? In the preceding verses to this. And so he says, we hid because we were naked, right? So he told us, he said, asked him, he says, well, who told you you were naked? And so of course, the man, Adam, he just started confessing, right? If he's in the world, you say it was a snitch. And so he, he started um, just talking about all kinds of things, but he never took accountability for his actions. He never took the personal accountability for his actions. And we have a lot to learn. You'll hear me talk a lot about Adam and Eve. You hear me talk a lot, really, about the book of Genesis, period, because you can't appreciate where you are or where even you're going until you understood, until you understand, excuse me, where you were. Um, and where we where we were was magnificent in God's sight and all of his 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 glory. Um, but we took it upon ourselves to separate. Um, and it was a choice. And there might have been deception there, but that's why we have to be strong in God's word. And if we're not, we need, need to have that relationship just enough to go and ask him that he might move us in a direction of his word. Right. So there's a lot to learn from Adam and Eve here. And we talked about. Um, two weeks ago, and, and we hit on just a smidgen last week about the, the Proto-Evangelum, right? Uh, meeting the first good news, right? The first gospel. Two words, there's a compound word, Proto meaning uh, first and Evangelum, um, coming from really where we get evangelism, evangelize, um, that, that, good, that good news, that, that first gospel, that first good news. Um, and so here we talk about really uh, eschatological um, and in, in terms of the end times, in terms of when Jesus Christ will come back and he will crush Satan, right? That's, that's probably the best way to put that. Um, and then it also talks about soteriology in terms of the, the road to redemption, the path to salvation. And, and if you've been following us on Facebook, you've seen some of those words in terms of either the terminology or some of our Greek words in terms of esch eschatology, uh, the study of the end times, the doctrine of the end times, um, soteriology stemming from uh, soteria, um, meaning deliverance or salvation, and really twofold there, meaning 
Uh, the same word means two different things. It means the eternal or the natural there. So a little bit of geek knowledge there. So if it if, if seems familiar, hopefully you've been following us on a Facebook um, site there. And you'll see throughout the week, we'll put some Greek, some Hebrew terms that we've either talked about uh, in Bible study, thrown out during some preaching, or just, just things that you might see uh, coming through the Bible. And, and so we like to highlight those. We've got some Bible trivia in there. And then as well as some theological terms, all these things that as you come to church, you come equipped, empowered, and courage, looking for a relationship with God. Because remember, how do we learn to walk? We learn to walk one step at a time. And we do this spiritually by one, getting to know God, right? And I, and I stole this from Dr. J.B. Hickson. Um, and you can check him out at notbyworks.org. Uh, powerful, powerful man of God uh, who, who will break some things down. Um, and, and, and he talks about that, but we, we expect to believe in God going from A to Z and there's a whole bunch of other alphabets in between there. And so spiritually, we first got to know God, we got to, we got to get a relationship with him. And this is why it's so important, not just to get the things of God. So where am I going with this? And so when, when we talk about, when we talk about, when we talk about Adam and Eve, right? They got caught up in a moment with the things of God. And the one thing that he told them that they couldn't have instead of God right? And they allow unsound doctrine from Satan taking a form of a serpent. We've all been there to come and to tort and, 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 tort and, 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 and twist, uh, or contort, got my words jumble up there, to, <laughs> to contort and twist um, uh, the, the, the doctrine in which God had given. And so um, not only did they not take accountability, the personal accountability, they didn't take collective responsibility, and there was no engaged leadership where man was given authority, right? He was, he was empowered. He was equipped with God's word. He was empowered. He had dominion over all these things. So he should have been able to talk. The woman should have been able to talk to the serpent and cast it out. And this would have been an end of discussion. And the, the world would have been a whole different place, right? The world would have been a whole different place and uh, if they had just done that. And he gave them the ability to go for it and get increased. So that's why I really like that, that, that upper left hand uh, corner up here because it really breaks it down. Um, the man blames the woman, the woman blames the serpent, none of them takes uh, accountability. And so when I talk about the proto evangelum, then God starts, he starts administering punishment. Boom, boom, boom. Um, and all of them had ramifications, right? Um, so man and woman were kicked out of the, the penthouse and were sent to the outhouse and sin began to spread like wildfire, but the prophecy that is given there, we're still living off of that, right? And talking about her seed and that seed is our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. And so he is coming again and he will crush and put it in, uh, to say Satan. But because of that, God proclaims that there will be enmity, right? Between our enemy, our, our, our sworn enemy, right? And we talked about last week, we talked about rivals. We talked about if you're using sports analogies, you talk some of the greatest rivalries there are. If you're a college football fan, you talk about Ohio State, and Michigan, Army, Navy. You just go through and, and these things are regional, right? Um, Florida State, Florida. You, 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 could, you can talk all these different things. Uh, um, uh, Alabama, LSU, right? You, you, you could just um florida tennessee you you can just hit a number of things that's just football you're talking about basketball um you can hit a whole bunch of things but rivalries right uh if you want to talk about the nba the lakers and the celtics you, you just rivalries um but it's okay here uh your enemy doesn't like you you don't like him and we talked about a state of or feeling of being actively opposed or hostile to someone or something in other words they just don't like each other so we um are at ought with one another. And so if we understand that, and this is why I like uh, dissecting the words here in the Bible study, uh, because if you understand that God proclaimed that there's enmity, a true hatred, a true disdain for one another, and oh, by the way, that enmity will result in, in, in the seed coming and crushing your sworn enemy, right? So is it any wonder that the enemy is coming and doing everything that he can to get you away from your heavenly father? Think about that for a second. So in a modern day age, why on God's green earth would you invest in the things in which the enemy has something to say? Now think about that for a second. Think about it. Think about it hard. 
right? So late it seems right to man, but it ends at least to destruction. So uh, don't want to get caught on the okie doke and, 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 and don't want to, um, to, to, to slip on a proverbial banana pipe and that's a uh, banana peel. And that's why we have to be sound in the word of God. It says, um, this is faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And so you've got to inverse the proportion. Think about this for a second. Um, any McDonald's eaters out there, right? Any, any fast food uh, eaters, junk food eaters, think about it. If you ate McDonald's every day, you, the results are you would have a McDonald's type body, right? And you have McDonald's type results, right? And so what I mean by that is, is you can't be talking about body by Jake doing body by McDonald's, right? And so you can't expect the spiritual things and have a, a, a strong spiritual life from the Lord. Now, there could be a, some other spiritual things going on in your body, right? But it won't be of the Lord if you're not getting a steady dose and diet of the things of the Lord, right? So if you're doing body by Mickey D's and not body by Jake, you're going to have a body uh, that, that has the outputs of Mickey D's, right? Um, and so if you inverse that and you start lessening the, the frequency of the Mickey D's and start you know, going and getting a little bit more veggies, a little bit more fruit, getting some water instead of that supersized Coke, right? Starting to, to inverse that, then you start to see the change there. And this is, this is what, what Paul was highlighting in terms of the reaping and the sowing and so forth, right? In terms of the investment, if you will, right? That investment strategy that we're talking about. That as, is it, as you invest into these things, this is your choice to go, just like it's your choice, right? And you're still enjoying Mickey D's, but maybe not as much. And then when you go, maybe not getting the supersized, maybe going and getting the value sized, right? Um, and then maybe not eating it three times a day, maybe eating it once a day and then whittling it down to once a week. And now you're inversing some of these things until you can wean yourself maybe off of that and get to maybe a healthier solution there where you can air fry some potatoes and get some fries and you can air fry some, some, some leaner hamburger meat and go for, you, you can have it. It's just not the same way there. And this is what God is trying to tell you. I, I am the creator. I have given all these things that you might prosper. Remember in Genesis chapter one and in Genesis chapter two, it, it tells us the story of creation and about how he created all these things that we might prosper. And then we might have dominion over these things, but we, we looked at the one thing that God had created that said we couldn't have. And that's what we allowed unsound doctrine to tell us to be able to go forth and to have. So, so think about those things, but that enmity, why are we chasing after something that is no good for us? It's no good to us and means nothing but harm. And so we talked about the outputs of this fall uh, and a new nature. And that's that sinful nature. And we talked about our new position that's separated. And I don't think we understand how important that is. If you've ever left the house, right? You left wherever you, you grew up, be it a guardian, be it your, um, your, your parents, your natural parents, or whomever it is, that house that you grew up in and that, that residence uh, that, that you grew up in. You're like, I can't wait to leave this place, right? But then when you're out on your own, and, and, and some of us might not have left on, on the best of terms, but if you even if you did leave on the best of terms, right, now you have some separation. But if you leave on terms in which you can come back to that household, it's not so bad, right? Because you know you can come back. But the chasm that has been created because of sin, right, because of, because of sin does not afford us naturally to be able to go back in there. Again, why are we chasing after the things of this world, right? Why are we chasing after the one that, that, that comes to kill, steal, and destroy? That's just like giving money to that person who, who is not trying to invest your money into sound things, right? The devil doesn't have any interest in investing what you have uh, in the things of God, right? Matter of fact, what he's investing in is your destruction. And if he can, he's going to get a two for a three for, you know what I mean by that, right? He's going to take you. He's going to take some others with it right so when sin came into the garden of Eden, sin is bad by itself but it didn't just corrupt the woman it corrupted the man then just didn't just corrupt man and woman it corrupted all of creation and us as well and it continues to give and give and give it's a spiritually transmitted disease right it's 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 that that severe and the only care for it is god but yet we look every place else but god 
right? So we talked a little bit about the, the word sin and, and that word sin coming from harmatia, right? Uh, harmatia, um, the Greek word meaning to miss the mark, right? It, it, in other words, you just didn't get it. You did not stand in right, uh, you did not come up in right standing. So uh, that's the second portion of it, to, to fall short of the glory of God. And so when you think about that, the severity of sin and why, uh, why it's just unacceptable to God, we, we continue to miss the mark. We, we are that proverbial baseball player, softball player that gets up and we're in the lineup. And every time we get up there, we just, we just strike out or we fly out or we're, we're, we're trying to run to base and we, we just we miss the mark. We just don't quite get there. But the spoiler is that, that we can never make the mark. Right. We're just going to keep on swinging. We, for those that are Peanuts fans, uh, uh, fans of Charlie Brown, where, where Lucy continues to hold the football. And, and every time um, Charlie Brown goes up there, you know, he's convinced that this time's going to be different. And well, that's how we are. Every time we go to bat, every time we go to kick that ball, we think this time is going to be different. But, but there is none righteous among us, not one. Right. There's no one righteous among us, not one. Right. According to Romans 3 and 10. And so we have to understand that, that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3 and 23, right? And so when we, when we say this, we have to believe this and we have to understand that because of this, there is separation, that this new nature has caused separation and it, and it, it results in a new walk. This walk results um, from a carnal mind that is fleshly driven. It's no longer set on God. And so this is why I, I talk about that getting at a Mickey D's type of mentality, right? Or else we'll have body by Mickey D's. So we've got to get out of this, 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 this carnal mindset that's just set on the flesh or else we will have, as Paul tells us, uh, a, a, a body by flesh, right? If you sow to that flesh of the flesh, you will reap. And so we've talked about that. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is everlasting life. And that's Romans 6 and 23. And so this is, this is really what's in the balance here, right? The harmantia, uh, the uh, to miss the mark, to, to fall short of the glory of God. That's sin. And that's, that's with us every day as we talked about it. Paul talks incessantly about this, in particular in Romans 6. He talks about that, that, that we cannot go on doing this because we no longer have that life. And he goes on further uh, talking about having our minds transformed. And I challenged us at the beginning of the year and what God deposited, we got to win this battlefield that is our mind. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? So our minds can't be settled on what the flesh wants, because that's leading us down a path of death. And rest assured that the one that we have enmity with is the one that we're trying to snuggle up with. We're trying to be buds with the one who has nothing but bad intentions on the line. And the Bible clearly tells us this. He comes to kill steal and destroy i don't know of a mission statement that's any clearer than that uh god is not the author of confusion but the, but but our enemy is and there's enmity there a true this uh, uh uh feeling and inclination of hatred he does not like us and he actively that word active right not passively he actively comes to make sure that we not only stumble and bumble but we have an eternal separation from God. So why are we chasing after the things in which he's presenting us, right? This is why this year is so important to make sound investment, sound investment strategy. And it starts by uh, getting to know God, right? We, we got to know him in order to trust him so that we can believe him. Can we do that? How do we learn to walk? One step at a time, right? How do we walk? One step at a time. We, we learn this by um, by getting to know God, to be in relationship with him, when you begin to trust him, right? And then we start to believe in him. All right. So what's the outputs of this new nature, right? Uh, this, this separation that is caused by this new nature that results in a walk uh, begot of a carnal mindset um, that's driven by flesh. Well, it's that term iniquity that we talked about. That term iniquity. And iniquity is, 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 is being wicked or immoral, as you can see there. But really, truly, iniquity is the totality of the sinful nature, right? It's the corrupt nature. Um, it's the essence. And so we, we, we a lot of times like to, um, to overlay sin and iniquity. Well, really, sin 
is the root cause, right? Inequity, um, or, or, or really sin is, is being the root cause, but iniquity is the outputs of that, right? It's the totality of the nature of that. And that's what necessitates that we have to be delivered. And as we've talked about, it's not by our own works, right? Uh, it's not by our own works. And so when you go over here, and this is where we left off uh, the lower left hand, we talked about man's investment versus God's investment. And man's investment is sin, right? That's what we're putting into the world. Whether we're conscious of it or not, that's what our actions lead to. Now, recognizing that you have a problem is the first step to recovery, right? And so that new nature, that new position, that new walk, but here, here is just an added, um, an added clause onto that. There's a new outcome, right? There is a new outcome that stems from the new nature, the new position, and a new walk. Because sin entered into the world, there was, there was mercy given to us by God, right? He put an expiration date on us that we might not live eternally separated. So he gives us an out. That's how good our God is. Now, we... <laughs> We might not think about that because we came from the penthouse and we moved to the outhouse. And what I mean by that is, is the latter parts of Genesis chapter three talks about the, the, the severity of the transformation of what we have, right? Um, uh, of, of how now, well, the things that we had to do uh, to subjugate the earth and the things uh, that were becoming against us. But still, God is mighty in what he has given us, right? But God's investment is grace. It's his grace. And if you wake up each day, you've experienced his grace. You don't need a million plus dollars, although it's nice, to talk about God's grace in your life. Because as I've said, he has freely given it to us. And we'll break that down a little bit more. I, I talked about that word, uh, charis, uh, charisma. Um, and you see it there, the, the lower part. It means uh, charisma means gifts, right? Uh, so when you talk about a charismatic movement, you talk about uh, charisma, um, those are all gifts, right? Um, and so um, when you look here in terms of gra uh, grace, it's, un it's the unmerited favor that's freely given to us. So when we talk about free grace, it's Christ crucified. He freely gives it to us, whether we receive it or not. We just simply have to believe it. Uh, and that's how we receive it, right? And so... Uh, he gives us that. He also invests in us reconciliation. God rebooted the world once, right? But he gave the opportunity by, with, and through um, the grace he exhibits through Noah. The, from the time in which God looked down and said he, he hated that, um, he, he wished that he had never created mankind. He hated the fact that he created mankind um, and then found favor in Noah. And to the time where he told them to build the ark and gather seven of the clean animals, two of the unclean animals, there was a gap there. And this gap wasn't minutes, it wasn't seconds, it wasn't minutes, it wasn't hours, it wasn't days, it wasn't weeks, it wasn't months. It was years. And it wasn't just years, it was decades, right? So think about that for a second. He gave an opportunity for creation um, to be reconciled back onto him. Not to Noah, but to reconcile uh, back onto him. And they didn't. Um, and the world was uh, was destroyed. There's a second coming of that. And then once again, um, he is giving um, just like if you want to if you want to take the symbology here um, and, and, and it's not necessarily written this way, but it's but you could take a look at it. Um, just as God had Noah build the ark um, and, he, and he offered that redemption, that reconciliation for all the creation there. Those who chose to believe entered into it and were, were accessible. Those who didn't, when a day of judgment came, were excluded and were not allowed to come in. When the kingdom comes again, when, when Christ comes in all of his glory with his church and with his angels and brings judgment upon this earth, those who did not believe upon Christ crucified, you see the, the comparisons there, the ark being a type of, 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 of cross there, a type of Christ, um, did, did not believe upon Christ crucified, right? Um, same with the Israelites in, in, the, in the wilderness, in the desert, um, where John 3 and 14 talks about just as Moses lifted up the serpent, so must Christ be lifted up, right? So must I be lifted up, right? Um, that whoever should look at it and believe will, will be delivered, will be saved, 
right? And so he reconciles, he gives that. And it's just, just very same there as those who chose not to believe on the day of judgment were not allowed entry and were, were, were taken away, right? And so this is where God's grace is there. It's freely extended, but you have to, you have to choose to believe it. He's not going to force you uh, to do it, right? So this road to redemption, this path to salvation is eternal life. This is what he affords to us and the breadcrumbs that ensue there. That, that, that um, soteriology that I talked about, I challenge you from cover to cover to look for it because God lays the breadcrumbs um, for the road to redemption, the path of salvation. We simply need to look and believe as the Holy Spirit guides us, right? But Titus 3, 4 through 7 tells us, but when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, um, and, and the love of our God, our Savior toward man appeared, not by works. And so this is where I get this from. It's not by works, a righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. It's not our own, because we'd still be wallowing in our sin. Uh, through the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Ah, there he is, the Holy Spirit, the power of it, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now, that's a very powerful thing there. Now, I want you to look at that word, hamartia, right? Hamartia, um, sin, to miss the mark, right? We miss the mark. And I've, 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 I've harped on this the last two and a half weeks. And I've taken some time out tonight again to go over this, the severity of sin. If nothing else, that eternal separation from our Lord or God. Uh, eternal damnation. That's the that that's the finality of it. There will be no more. I'm sorry. There will be no more. Right now is the time, and this is why Jesus wants us to go out to the highways and the byways and to proclaim the good news that there is a door in which you can go. You simply have to believe. The door has been unlocked. It's been open for any and all who would choose to believe. Right. The the price of admission is there. But just like with Noah's time. Where the world was so depraved and folks were going in their rubbery and their drunkenness and their idolatry and their, their sexual immorality, all these things, right? They didn't have time to stop and to believe in what God was, was saying and what he was showing. The judgment was coming. And it's not going to be by their own works, just like then, um, but it is coming. So when you get to the lower right-hand corner here, and this is where we're rowing towards, um, Sin always requires atonement. Just understand, if you, if you take nothing else out of this, this, this session, sin always requires atonement. And it's not by our own works, right? Due to those outputs that I talked about, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, always remember that. The gift of God, it's a gift. It's freely given. We can't earn it. We can't afford it. We certainly don't deserve it. The gift of God is everlasting life, right? Um, but that output to that sinful nature, there's no one righteous among us, not one. There's none righteous among us, according to Romans 3 and 10, right? Um, and so all those scriptures down there, I need you to, to keep those close. And, and every time that you, you start thinking about the goodness of the Lord or, or you start lamenting about what you perceive he did or didn't give, just, just think about that. that. That none is righteous, not one. Um, and Romans 3 and 23, I... I, I transpose that. That should read um, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> so, so when you go in there, it's it, the Bible doesn't repeat itself. Romans three and ten is there is none righteous, not one, right? And then Romans three and twenty three is is that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of sin. So we all have the same start point. So we need a savior, right? And so God realizing this in the book of Isaiah tells us this, that, that, that he took it upon himself to bring us back. Right. And so there's, there's dual, um, dual meaning behind that in the book of Isaiah and Isaiah is, is prophesying to Judah. He's prophesying to the lower kingdom at this time. Um, Israel was split. You had the northern kingdom, which was Israel proper, and then the, the, the southern kingdom, um, which was Judah, all right? Um, and, and the tribe of Benjamin was absorbed up into them. Um, so, so the 10 tribes that we talk about are lost in the northern kingdom, and they didn't listen to some of the woes that Micah proclaimed and some others, and they psh, dissipated until a time and such which they will be called back to Israel. And so the book of Isaiah, um, talks about this 
Um, but but when, when he talks about taking it back onto his own hand, he sees the depravity of his own people, right, and the world at large, and he talks about how judgment is coming, and he, he goes and he prophesies about the Messiah, right, the anointed one. He talks about um, uh, Jesus Christ, and in the book of Messiah is where you, you hear about um, the, the virgin birth, and you, you hear about uh, naming him Emmanuel, that God, uh, God is with us, God among us, right? And you, you hear all these things. Um, and so very powerful book, the, the book of Isaiah uh, is there. And so when we talk about that, that God takes it upon himself, um, that is just an outward declaration of what he's already been placing. And what you saw in the proto, uh, the proto evangelum and there in Genesis 3, he already proclaims it, that he's He's sending out the seed to go and, to, um, and, 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 and to, to crush the serpent on his head as the serpent goes and strikes at the heel, right? The serpent thinks he's one when, when Christ goes to the cross, but if he knew what was good for him, he would have never let that happen because then the veil was torn and it now allows access to the whole of creation. And this is what we talk about um, in terms of that, God taking it back um, in, in terms of providing it to all of creation, right? But he's still will redeem his chosen ones. And through them, um, um, he will, Jesus Christ will rule um, through, um, through his seat in, in Israel, right? Which brings us to our other fancy word for the day, propitiation, right? Don't try to say that three times. Um, and if you can say it three times straight, you're a better person, better man or woman than I am uh, without getting tongue twisted, right? But that propitiation is basically, um, a an appeasement and a substitutionary um, replacement. So what did I talk about? Sin always requires atonement. And so we talked last week about how at the end of Genesis 3, um, in order for God to go and to clothe them, right? Because their nakedness is seen as unrighteous. It's considered uh, sin. But the clothing of them, it was, even though they did not repent, God forgave, right? Um, and he did this, they were, they were atoned by the sacrifice. There was a blood sacrifice that came from an animal, right? That's where they got the hides and the skins to get their clothing. So hidden in there is that little nugget there um, uh, of what would be to come. But sin always requires some atonement. And as you go throughout the rest of, of the Bible, the, 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 the real true appreciation of what Jesus is to us, right, is that that all the other previous high priests that stem from Aaron and his sons and the Levites, right? They just couldn't quite get it because they all have that sinful nature, right? Which really, in true essence, is that iniquity. It's the totality of that, of that sin corrupting like a cancer and going through, right? They just, they just couldn't get it uh, because of their depravity um, and their own need for atonement, right? So God took it upon himself and he sent in the propitiation that is um, our Lord Jesus Christ. And so when you look at, at 1 John 2 and 2 there, uh, it talks about, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, right? Um, he is the substitution there. He is, he is the appeasement, right? So when God looks at us, we have not lost that sinful nature. That's an important thing for us to understand. Not until we receive glorification, that glorified body. Right. And this is what Paul harps on uh, really from three um, from Romans three to, to really eh, parts of, of, of Romans nine. But really um, from from Romans three, where we talk about severity of sin and, and, and um, into Romans eight. But really, if you want to highlight Romans three and Romans, um, Romans six and Romans eight, he then he talks about there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Right. And what he means by that is, is because of a propitiation, right? The appeasement, the, the, the substitutionary sacrifice, right? Remember, sin always requires some of us. About the third or fourth time I said that. So every time you sin, God still looks at you and says, you've done it, but he sees Christ. And this is the important reason of why we have Christ. And we repent, hopefully, um, and that separation, that temporary separation. Because the, the thing is, is that while our position, our eternal position in Christ is secure, right? And that's guaranteed by the Holy Spirit being in us, right? Because um, Romans 8 tells us that if, and unless the Spirit is in you, you're not his. But he can't deny those that are his, right? So that's how we know the eternal security. 
But what can happen is, is because sin is an abomination to him, right? That that can lead it leads to separation, and it can lead to a premature death, and it can lead to loss of rewards and benefits to come once we enter into the kingdom, right? So there's still much to 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 gain there. Um, but this propitiation, as we go further on First John, there it says, uh, and He Himself is the propitiation for our, our sins, right? And other words, the appeasement for us, because there's nothing we can do to earn. There's nothing we've done to deserve, and we certainly can't afford it. But He He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our, for ours only, but also for the whole world. So remember when I talked about that—that that sin is contagious. And it would be bad if just Adam or just Eve or just Adam and Eve just fell by the wayside, but they took all the creation with them. But as, as God sent his only begotten son to the cross for the sins he didn't commit and for the death he didn't deserve, um, the whole of creation now is redeemed. And we, his people, they just simply believe in this testimony, Christ crucified, right? Um, believing in that testimony in a whole of creation um, will be redeemed and saved, right? Um, and so it's about that, that sound investment of investing that mind, that heart, that body and its soul. And just one simple thing, believing that Jesus Christ is who he says he is, that he'll do what he says he'll do. And so we'll wrap up here um, in Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is parallel um, with, with Titus 3, 4, and 7, because it talks about it's not anything that we've done, but the gift of God. So I'll read it for you. For, for by grace, you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. That's that word again, gift, that, that charis, right? That, that, um, that the charis, charisma, uh, it's freely extended to all those who would receive it. Um, and, and so he gives. And so the next time you don't think God has given you anything, just think about what he has already given and you have enough, right? And this is why it's important to to focus on the cross let that be your compass the word be your roadmap and the holy spirit be your guide your 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 gps the god position saints right that's that's what the holy spirit will do he, he'll convict you of sin but he also gives us uh gifts right he gives us because as as jesus ascended um he allowed the holy spirit to descend upon us and he gave the church gifts right and we might edify comfort um, and console and, and go forth and be equipped and power and courage for today. But he says, uh, for by grace, you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves, right? So in other words, it's not our own works. It is the gift of God. So put that in perspective, what we've invested into this world, what God's invested into this world. And, 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 and think about this in the natural, that if you were going to a broker, which broker would you, would you go to, right? If, if one of the brokers was advertising what, what self has, right? Uh, you wouldn't want to go to him or her. But if the other one was talking about the grace and, and all the things that come along with it, that's the one that you want. If you want to, you know, make some return on investment there. It says, it's not by works. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. No one is righteous, not one, right? Um, and so as we close out, I just want to thank God for the propitiation, the appeasement, the atonement of our sins. And so we took a little bit of time out to go back over what we have talked about over the last two or three weeks. But I really want to emphasize and I want you to understand the fall and the consequences of those fall. Our enemy did not skate out of that. He knows he has that expected end, but yet he's still scheming to go for it with this plan. He is still actively pursuing to kill, steal and destroy you. Right. Um, he's still out there doing the things that he thinks are necessary and require to keep you away from your God, right? Um, but there's always judgment of sin, right? Sin always leads to separation and sin always requires atonement, right? So think about that as your actions go forth. Can we go with him into prayer right now? Can we go into prayer Heavenly Father, we call to you and we thank you tonight. We thank you for your love and for your glory. We thank you for allowing us to see the severity of our sin, Father God, and allowing our hearts to be circumcised tonight, Father God. We openly uh, and willingly give you our hearts tonight, Father God. We thank you now for touching our hearts and allowing us to repent, Father God. To, we, we, we thank you for allowing the blood of Christ to bridge that gap 
that is between us, Father God, the, the, the iniquity, Father God, that totality, that, that nature of the outputs of our sins, Father God, the wholeness of that corrupt nature, Father God, made new and renewed by, with, and through the blood of Jesus Christ. And Father God, we know we have no right, no expectation uh, to ask of anything of you, but because of this blood, Father God, we have a new walk, a new talk, a new nature, Father God, that has nothing in common with that sinful nature. And so, Father God, we thank you for allowing us to see ourselves, Father God. But Father God, we also exalt you for allowing us to see who we are through you, Father God, the rebooted image. And we thank you for that tonight. We thank you for uplifting us tonight, Father God, and meeting us at the point of need. For surely the God of eternal salvation can deliver us from all things seen and unseen that are causing our mind to be twisted and contorted, Father God, and causing our heart to be faint and to lose faith, Father God. And we, we ask that you equip and empower and encourage our walk tonight. And as we go forth, Father God, whatever physical, mental, or even spiritual ailments are coming against us, Father God, we recall your word that says, greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And so, Father God, we glory in your holy name, not by our own works, but Father God, giving you all the glory. And so, Father God, we give you all the praise and we worship you tonight. Now, Father God, at the sound of this voice or something that was seen tonight, Father God, if just the one will repent, Father God, then it's just the one will come and a trust in Jesus Christ, Father God, we touch and agree with heaven right now that that eternal salvation, Father God, might set a fire, Father God, that, 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 that eternal salvation for just the one might cause a, 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 a spiritual revival, a spiritual forest fire that will go throughout the lives of those who dare to believe. They will bear witness, Father God, into that one individual of what you have already done for them. So, Father God, we glory in your holy name for that open door. And we pray that not just the one, but the multitudes will walk through that door, Father God. For we know that tomorrow is not promised, Father, but that this word has gone out and has touched every heart, mind, body, and soul in some kind of way. For the believer, it's enhanced and enabled his or her walk. For the unbeliever, it's planted the seed of Christ that they can make a better and a more informed decision. So, Father God, we glory in your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. We thank you for attending. Go in peace, be blessed, and give some Jesus.